All right, Zaire, we're we're live. We're out we here. Are, yes, we are live. How are you? I'm good. I haven't seen you in a little while. You've had a had a birthday since the first program, didn't you? When when was your when was your birthday? Yes, August 29th, the same okay. day as Michael Jackson. So you know, <laughs> I guess good. that's a great thing, a great sign. How was it? Uh, it was pretty great. It was a monumental, you know, I, I turned another decade. So uh, I, it, it was it was very good. I was able to you know, hang out with family and friends and, you know, bring it in a good, wholesome way. So it was good. I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, all the people out there, uh, you know, Zaire and I are just kicking it for a few minutes before we dive in. But this is the second program of our Southern Art Wider World Project. And so I'll tell all of you now that throughout the, the program, we want y'all to drop any questions and comments into the comments, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and uh, we'll, we'll pull those in. But today, you know, last time we talked about the landscape, we were with Ralph Eubanks and we examined the real and imagined landscape. And today we're talking about movement and migration. So we'll, we'll see how Anderson worked that into his his art, but also how it works in the contemporary South. And one of the things we'll be talking about is uh, the Southern city, you know, how movement and migration has influenced the urban landscape. So while we were talking off air, we were kind of throwing around these ideas of, uh, you know, Memphis and New Orleans, you're up in Memphis. We're of course down here new, near New Orleans and the river connects both those places. But um, in your perspective, when you think about the city almost as a extension of the landscape, it's like a human built landscape. You know, what's the character of, of your your Memphis city, but also just uh, your experience with southern cities? Uh, well, Memphis, when I think about like our, the culture, the landscape, I'm thinking, of course, the blues. I'm thinking barbecue. I'm thinking uh, the, the the downtown the suburbs and different, you know, pockets. We have different pockets in our city that is like, is, is very historic, like the Orange Mound uh, community, which was built for and by black folk and uh, just different enclaves of, of, of culture and things of that sort. So when I think of Memphis and I think of our landscape, I think it's like super rich. It's also diverse in, in ways that is not only like racially, but just as far as like what there is to do and what Memphis like claims in a sense. And as far as Southern cities, I feel like the same for other Southern, southern cities. I know while I was creating some of these uh, punctuations as we call it, I saw a lot of similarities between Memphis and NOLA with, you know, music being a staple and, you know, things of that sort. So yeah, what about you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't really lived other than Jackson, Mississippi. I've, I was born in Atlanta, but I moved when I was one years old. So can't really claim much memory from from that time. But uh, but I lived there later. And I think, you know, southern cities are interesting because, you know, they just like all cities, I suppose, but certainly southern ones, they have this character that's informed by all the different people who have come through and always enjoy the way, you know, cities have this authenticity, you know, when they're, when they're good cities, I suppose, you know, you, you can kind of turn a corner and this is true. Like in new Orleans, you'll be in the French quarter, the, you know, or bourbon street, of course, the things people who come from outside think about, but then you just take a few turns and you're in the neighborhoods where people live. And that's where the real city, the heartbeat of the city exists. So I've always enjoyed that. And, like I said, Jackson, Mississippi is where I was living before that being down here on the coast. And it has um, its own kind of, you know, grind attitude to it. And the people there who are trying to continue to move, um, you know, things forward and, and kind of write the next chapter of a city. So cities, you know, they never really die. They just evolve and grow and change. And I do think there's there's a kind of a heartbeat and a lifeblood to a city that um, is brought by the people. You know, like you might think of the the open delta having its own character and a lot of that's driven by the actual land but in a city i feel like it's driven by the things that people built and walter anderson actually depicted that which people don't really think about but i think it's part of the landscape for sure yeah for sure i definitely agree you'll see that um in all of these cities you'll see how culture 
different cultures bring that with them and how you can identify in different cities. Like I said, with Memphis and New Orleans, I could identify, okay, these are the same people who also, who were probably a part of the same culture that comes, that have brought the, this culture to both New Orleans and Memphis. And I can see the similar the similarities, you know? And so yeah. that that's powerful. Totally. Yeah. Well, folks, like I said, if y'all are watching now, go ahead and tell us where you're coming from. We're about to get into it and uh, look forward to joining y'all on the other side of this video. It's Southern Art, Wider World. It all starts the southern part of the map. The influence the globe ain't nothing harder than that. We way smarter in fact in the stories that you heard about us. Determination and birth the image. We learn the progress. It's all a process. Rebuild and regrow. When the value's much more than the silver and gold. See the stories passed down through the soil and the dirt. And we rose from the ashes, so we loyal to the earth. And we royal from our birth. See the beauty of the landscape. Gulf Coast waters crashing on the sandbanks. It's like a diamond, but hitting in plain. Sight. Gotta let the light shine, concealing it ain't right So I take my time, turn the page, make a line How I feel when I'm in the Mississippi state of mind Where the cotton goes high, eh? the chair moves slow eh? The river belongs just to get us so home to me Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. And as always, got to thank the people who made this possible and the institutions that made this possible. This is a project that is um, funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So uh, we're uh, deeply appreciative to them for recognizing the importance of Southern culture and, and what's happening down here in Mississippi. And then also uh, further support from the Mississippi Humanities Council. And we present this in partnership with the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. And as I mentioned, today's program is called Movement and Migration. It's the second in a series of uh, virtual programs we're doing that examines a different theme that we have found and continue to, to mine out of Walter Anderson's art in the collection that we have here at the museum. So as we do with these and we'll continue to do, we wanna ground it in the art. And for that, we're gonna take a little trip into the vault. Walter Anderson was a collector of ideas. He rode his bicycle thousands of miles all over the United States, up to New York, Pennsylvania, down to the Florida Keys, and through Texas into Mexico. He even ventured further, going to China on his way to Tibet, and then also to France and Spain to explore the cave paintings. For Walter Anderson, borders were really just imaginary lines on a map. When we think about movement, we're not talking just about the movement of people, but also the movement of ideas. Walter Anderson appreciated the diverse cultures that he was getting to experience, but he was also seeking that universal truth that all cultures and artistic forms are interconnected. So Simone Delarmi, we're, we're joined by um, a scholar from the University of Mississippi, the, our special guest for this episode. Simone, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Yourself? So we're, I'm doing well and we're really excited. We've been collaborating with you to examine your work, your scholarship, and it's been fun connecting it to, to the work of Walter Anderson. And I guess just to kind of open it up, you know, what we're talking about today, various things, you know, kind of cultural exchange, you know, how does movement and migration, as our curator Maddie Codling was suggesting, um, represent itself both as a movement of people, but also a movement of ideas. You know, so I guess to start, can you just ground us a bit in, in your lens into this, a little bit about your work? Yes, absolutely. And my interest is in globalization and migration movement is a huge part of that. So when I think of globalization, there's two key concepts. I think of my students, what I introduce them to when we start the unit. Uh, cultural diffusion, cultural hybridization, two concepts. And they're all about the movement, not only of people, but just as was said, ideas, uh, artifacts, pop culture, anything from foodways uh, to language. 
And with cultural diffusion, you emphasize the movement of these different ideas or practices from one society or culture to another. But where I'm really interested in is cultural hybridization. And that's where you have that diffusion, that movement of ideas, but you also have the embracing of those ideas and the transformation to fit the cultural context. So for instance, if you think of food ways, for me in Mississippi, never have I been introduced to crawfish sushi until I came here or other forms of, of food ways, uh, barbecue, but tacos. Because again, there's this fusion that's happening where there's an embrace of other cultures and customs that have come and been transformed. So yes, lots of exciting things that have happened. So when I think of globalization migration movement, I think of those two concepts where you have ideas, practices that are moving, but also being taken and transformed to fit the local cultural context. And I think that yeah. happens in art, it happens in food, music, language. It is fascinating. And, you know, when we think about Walter Anderson, so he was a traveler, you know, he, he read, read everything he could get his hands on. He was a voracious cultural consumer, I guess, before, you know, before the time when that was as easy to do as it is for us. But he, you know, went on his bicycle as our curator echoed all over the place. But he also, you know, went down to Costa Rica and to China and he was pulling all these different um, influences and just depicting the landscapes he was going to. Um, you know, all the way through, you know, the mid 20th century. And a lot of those techniques that he was finding these aesthetics, he would, he would then pull into his work. And so there was, you know, certainly a cultural diffusion of ideas happening. One of the ones he was, you know, most famous for um, was uh, a, a technique that he picked up from a, a Mexican art theorist named Adolfo Besmo Guard, and it was called the seven motifs. And these were by uh, Mogard identified as these seven marks that were present in all uh, primitive art forms through the centuries and, and eons. And Anderson then picked those up and, and started to work with them himself. So I wonder when you, um, you know, when you think about something like Anderson's use of, you know, the seven motifs. So he's taking, you know, not, not directly from any one culture, but from, you know, um, an artist, a Mexican artist who worked in Paris, who was trying to himself write about and distill these forms from all across the world and across history. And then Anderson's taken it and, and he's doing work that is based on his coastal landscape. Is that sort of cultural diffusion and hybridization uh, one in the same? Is it, there are both things happening there? And I mean, as a cultural anthropologist, what he was doing just alone in terms of uh, what I've read and interest in art of different nations. I've seen it classified as primitive art sometimes using a language uh, of the time, but absolutely. I mean, through his travels, through that movement, there are different cultural influences, absolutely, that you see reflected. But again, the hybridization comes through the lens. He must have seen it through. Uh, where was he actually uh, at that time, historically, at that moment? Was he in the South, you know, as he was painting or sketching? So he was still in, you know, that space and place uh, that we call the South. But again, having moved and traveled from New York to Latin America and having all these different cultural influences uh, embodied in his art. So absolutely, I'm sure there's a hybridization happening, uh, but globalization enables that. And he was just an early, early example of that. You know, how early did globalization and migration start? He's an early example, perhaps. How do you think about the um, the points of transmission or the direction of transmission of culture? So, for example, we're talking about Walter Anderson, who decided, you know, to pick up in in 1949, go to China to try to find, you know, Tibetan temple art, or he went to France to examine the cave paintings, moving all around, going down to Costa Rica and through Mexico and to New York and Florida and Texas, you know, versus. Um, you know, that's a kind of an outward searching on his part, but then you've also got influx of, of migration where people are, you know, coming from afar to a new nation and then their um, cultural ways are then shared with the community, you know, that they've come to. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious if there's um, anything interesting that you find about the, that, that kind of paradigm and perhaps juxtaposition between someone seeking culture and there's certainly that's a, a close 
kin, kindred spirit, unfortunately, to kind of colonialism, which is not not something that is ideal, but certainly there are, it, it happens the exploration of of um, of other places, and then versus the the flip side where someone is coming to a place and the people that that are they are interacting with may not have even um, knew that this culture would be coming to their shores, uh, so to speak. So there's something happening there where sometimes such folks are seeking culture. Other times culture diffuses uh, without a little, without much um, awareness of, of the, the populace who's now uh, consuming it. So how do you think about those two things? So, I mean, it's transformed the discipline of anthropology of what I do as a cultural anthropologist. I mean, people think about anthropology and they think, of archaeology usually, or the study of these exotic places, exotic peoples. Uh, and that's transformed. I mean, with migration and movement, individuals are coming here. And we've done more of an applied anthropology where you can engage with people in their everyday lives. Uh, and as a result, you have cultural fusions that happen uh, through food ways, the introduction of food from different countries, uh, different cultures. You have, I hope we'll talk about it later, individuals that realize that they have to adapt uh, what was traditional to them to meet the needs and the tastes of Southerners. So there's so much fusion and, and movement that happens and exciting changes and transformations, I think, that I see. But again, both going back and being grounded in hybridization, diffusion of cultures and this coming together that that happens and that is enabled, I think. Yeah, well, one of the works we, I wanted to, to talk about, um, which is a, another interesting chapter in Walter Anderson's movement and his long career of moving about was um, a period of time when he famously escaped um, a mental institution in Maryland and walked back to Ocean Springs. And so he did these this portrait of shoes. And certainly there's a lot of, uh, you know, meaning just in that on its own, that the shoelaces not being in there because the patients uh, weren't allowed shoelaces, uh, you know, things like that for, for various concerns of, you know, suicide just to protect the patient. So there's no shoelaces in here. And so you've got this personality that's emerged from this, from these objects, but then it made me think, and I think we probably had a similar connotation that, um, you know, more, present day, you think about the the border crossing, you know, the U.S. Mexico border and how um, sh shoes and uh, garments and many other things, including uh, grimmer uh, scenes are found in the desert from people crossing. So this is a movement on foot. And in this case, uh, just as in, you know, a, a migrant case across the border, it was not an, um, a vacation for Anderson. He was, uh, you know, escaping um, an institution and trying to get home. Whereas, you know, there's a, a border crossing that happens, you know, every minute that someone's trying to, to flee, um, you know, a dearth of opportunity for a new home. So when you look at those shoes, you know, what, what kind of stories or uh, recollections come to your mind? I think of my research and I think of escape. You said that word just hit me when you said escape. And I think of uh, the research I did in Orlando, Florida, Osceola County. A uh, suburb called Buenaventura Lakes, and I was introduced to what was called the Encargado system. And that term was actually coined by an anthropologist, another cultural anthropologist doing research uh, amongst individuals from El Salvador in the suburbs. But she found that individuals were moving into single family homes, uh, and maybe they bought the home, maybe they were renting, but they transformed the home and it became a business. It was a form of entrepreneurship that some people maybe shunned uh, in a community, in a suburb, but it was a way to make a little extra money, you know, to break down your home into these units that you can rent, even though it's a single family home. And so I see those shoes and I think of the undocumented Mexican uh, immigrant that lived in the home where I rented to do my research and I think of that because I think of the reasons why he crossed the border. Uh, again, he was 17 years, of, 17 years old. His father already lived in the U.S., uh, but he said shoes. He mentioned shoes as a reason for his migration, for crossing the border, for taking the risks. And what he endured, I mean, horrific, horrific things that he, uh, they got lost in the desert, uh, 
a woman with a baby that was part of uh, the group, you know, horrific things that happened to them. But he mentioned shoes as being really important to part of his rationale. And to me, that seemed materialistic initially, like shoes. But he explained that he didn't have shoes in Mexico, that he didn't have food, uh, all these things that he was struggling for. And that was the reason, you know, those uh, people who study migration talk about push-pull factors. And those were the reasons, you know, things as simple as having the ability to buy a pair of shoes or food. So why the border crossings? What is it that was pushing somebody from their nation state? I think that always is something I go to, what was happening there. So wow. yeah, a lot of emotions and thoughts that those shows in terms of border crossings bring to me, but it's stories of people, of individuals. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a, a larger uh, thing we'll get into in a minute is that, you know, shoes being on the, the, a small example of something that is um, inorganic and not living, but that holds the stories of people. And then to the largest extension of that, perhaps, is that cityscapes themselves are, you know, they may be brick and mortar, um, but there's something uh, beating inside them, too. So that's that's a good segue, actually. You know, we're going to we're going to take it into New Orleans and uh, Zaire Love, our multidisciplinary filmmaker and, and curatorial fellow, has uh, has uh, offered and produced something to get us there. So for those who, who didn't know, you know, Walter Anderson was from New Orleans. And so in addition to that, that piece of film, we're also looking at some of the works he did there. And I, you know, he, was, he was most known, of course, for, for his depictions of nature. But I find it really compelling that he has this series of uh, New Orleans images, which, of course, show transportation and movement, um, both of people and, and just of the city itself. It's almost like it's vibrating with an energy. And I think to, to the point of, uh, we mentioned it in the pre-show, but folks who go to New Orleans specifically, you know, you see a certain uh, snow globe of New Orleans. If you're just dropping in, uh, maybe you got a layover or you're, or you're going there to, you know, to have some oysters and, and something on Bourbon Street, but it's a whole different experience when you live there or when you visit there as more of a um, kind of a regional um, kind of visitor who, who knows the city and who returns again and again, because people live there, they call it home and not many people live on Bourbon Street, fortunately for, for them, because that's not, that's not exactly what, that's not all the city is. So you have an interesting um, kind of background with, with some of the New Orleans history too. How do, how do you see and in, in, in the work you've done, what's the story of New Orleans as it relates to movement and migration, perhaps beyond the, you know, the black white binary, although New Orleans is in itself a, a multicultural gumbo, um, people don't always know all the different forces that make New Orleans so diverse. Right, and that's what fascinates me about New Orleans. And I think about the New Orleans exception, uh, just because I've studied how place specific migration is. And that's the thing I think from doing research in Orlando to Memphis to North Mississippi, I realize it is place specific. It depends on the politics of the location, uh, the receiving community. And with New Orleans, I see those I mean, I see that beautiful art and I wonder about the ambiguity of those people that are portrayed. Because you know what, those could have been the Mexican migrants from 1910 to 1939. And there's, I mean, historian Julie Wise comes to mind who have done brilliant, brilliant research uh, 
archival research to uncover a hidden history. But again, the ambiguity of those figures just uh, makes me think of the New Orleans exception where you had a Mexican population in terms of migration and movement uh, that came between 1910 to 1939, 1940. And other parts of the country, Mexicans were perceived in a very particular type of way. Uh, they were racialized in a very particular type of way. And in New Orleans, they navigated a black, white racial binary. And you know what? They were accepted as European white immigrants their experience was so incredibly different than the experience of other Mexican migrants, other immigrants, Latino immigrants, Hispanic immigrants in general more broadly, uh, in terms of where they got to live, in terms of the res residential spaces, uh, where their children got to go to school, in terms of education, marriage. And so there was assimilation. But again, you had this invisible population of Mexican migrants that were professionals and definitely lost in terms of the popular imagination of what New Orleans is, uh, the identity of the people. So that's what I think of when I think of the New Orleans exception and I see something like that and I think about who are the hidden people and voices that perhaps could have been pictured there. I think that's fascinating because, you know, when when I when I when we look at these these images of Anderson, I mean, the the immediate reaction, it just seems like a bunch of white folks going down the street. And that probably is what he was painting or depicting. But when we interpret it through that lens that you're talking about, um, it, it, it either potentially excludes a population or if you're talking about assimilation, perhaps these are not all white people. And I think that's a whole nother layer of um not just complexity, but just the, the kind of place identity that, that you were talking about where, you know, for example, um, you know, just because someone is Latin American, for example, doesn't mean they are Hispanic or, you know, there, there's all these different layers of, of kind of ethnicity and culture and geography that overlay onto each other. And sometimes that is that, that displays itself in what we'll see in a few minutes when we go to Summer Avenue in Memphis, where, you know, international, uh, vendors and merchants are setting up and sort of owning the, um, you know, the culture that they came from and and changing it and and all the rest. And then you versus the New Orleans exception, where you know you're you're talking about a, a group of people who, because of the context, decided to assimilate. Why why was it called? I mean, I, I guess it's self self uh, identifying, but the New Orleans exception. I mean, when when was that story fully understood in terms of the scholarship? I feel like it's something very new. Uh, the book is called The Heart of Dixie, Corazón de Dixie. Uh, and it's by Julie Wise, a historian. And again, she really uncovered this hidden history uh, where again, in the popular imagination, you don't think of Mexican migrants and their significance to New Orleans or even their presence. But again, it's because of, she documents, for instance, the census. How, and that's prevalent now as we're in the midst of, of finishing up collection and whatnot. But again, how people were actually recorded. You know, did you have a Spanish surname? Were you, did you appear to be white? Uh, did you appear to be of a different complexion? Would that change how you were marked versus maybe in the contemporary moment today where you have self-identification? So what was happening there? Again, I don't know that that actual terminology was used, the Southern exception. But for me, I see it as an exception because of what she's introduced in terms of archival research, where in other parts of the country, to be Mexican meant something very, very different. That was a population that was racialized as something other than white, uh, sometimes as a race, not as an ethnicity or a nationality. Uh, but a lot of times there was a lot of stereotypical derogatory negative uh, stereotypical types of actions that were then inflicted on the population. And again, I'm thinking West Coast, outside of the Southern US. And I'm thinking the 1940s, this is work again that WISE has done where you had sociologists that came in and did surveys and interviews and individuals that had done oral histories. They didn't have a recollection of discrimination uh, in the 20s and 30s, again, because they were seen as middle, upper class, upwardly mobile, white European immigrants. So a very different status they were able to achieve. And again, for a lot of reasons, a lot of complexity behind it. It's not, there's definitely nuance there behind the story, but able to achieve a level of assimilation that other Mexicans were not able to achieve. And it's not till like 
I think it's the 1960s that it's documented uh, with different movements happening West Coast that individuals started to become more aware of, you know what, this, this identity besides whiteness, European, uh, maybe upper class because of other social movements happening. And yes. Well, when you talk about movement and, and I mean, West Coast, obviously the whole development of, of the West has been driven by transportation and this movement by first, you know, train and obviously before that, you know, horse and, and uh, the Oregon Trail uh, version of the kind of great migration of, of kind of, uh, you know, the pioneer settler types. But then you get into more um, kind of middle 20th century, early 20th century, when you talk about the interstate system and that, that allowed people to, to actually get in their own cars. And then there's a whole kind of cultural and roadside, um, you know, economy that, that spreads in the suburbs and all the rest. I mean, when you talk about Southern cities and in your, in your study of, of Memphis and other places, as we prepare to kind of delve into that part of your, your work, mm -hmm. what has the role been of, you know, interstate travel or of kind of, uh, you know, starting with, you know, certain, certainly like the buses and trolleys in New Orleans that are in the cities and then didn't people getting their own cars and being able to spread out and have their own homes that weren't in the city center. How does that function when you think about the kind of cultural movement and, and migration within um, kind of a region like like within the country? So essential. And I didn't even think about it as deeply until you just posted uh, movement, migration, how central it is in a place like Memphis where I'm doing research where uh, Summer Avenue, a hub, where they're trying to brand it as an international district. But if I go back historically, uh, you know, the first Holiday Inn was there because it was a space for motor courts, uh, you know, motels, because it was a booming space for individuals that were trying to travel, you know, cross country. But you know what? With growth, that changed. People started to move to the suburbs. And there's all these complexities that happen, like, for instance, desegregation in Memphis, uh, the school system. People go and you have white flight and individuals going from the suburbs to the exurbs even. But again, from cities to suburbs. So you have all this movement and migration that's made possible by growth, by cars, by transportation individuals being able to move outside of the city center uh, to escape maybe policies and politics that are that are forcing them to change their their way of life. So I think of Memphis and, and how significant that actually was because that enabled immigrants to move into a space and place where there was white flight, where they could start communities and families and churches uh, in places that, again, were, were places where there were homes already constructed and certainly viable spaces to move in and build a life. But again, you had the movement and migration of people because of things like desegregation of schools or the development of suburbs and exurbs because of cars and transportation systems. So yes, you see migration and movement of people very much connected to technology mm. and to, yeah, developments in terms of the automobile. Or well, well, let's let, let's pick up from New Orleans then and, and, and go straight into Memphis um, a little deeper. And again, we'll, we'll do it courtesy of, uh, of Zaire Love.
like each culture has their own type of food and like people have the American people can come up in here and they go like they ask for us for like Mex Mexican sauces and stuff like that and that kind of makes me feel proud because they're like oh I'm like oh they like our culture they like our food and I feel like that's important so people can like try different kinds of food of like different kind of places like Colombian food, Honduran food, Mexican food So, you know, food is one of those art forms that I think we alluded to earlier is a perfect vehicle for for culture and for cultures to mix and to change. And taking it back to Anderson, you know, I mentioned he went to China in 1949. And while he was over there, he visited the markets uh, frequently. And, you know, he was he was seeing the kind of crabs and lobster and, and other um, products that were different species of these, but had this uh resonance for him because of his time growing up on the coast. And so in Summer Avenue, of course, there's many different kinds of businesses, but, um, you know, a lot of this is, is kind of food driven as well, but kind of reintroduce us, go a little deeper in terms of Summer, Summer Avenue. Like why, what was it that attracted you to that? Cause that's, that's your a focus of some of your more recent work, right? Yes. That's my new book project. Uh, Orlando, Florida was the first place and food was the space of, of contestation, but also of placemaking in Orlando. Uh, and you know what? I was drawn to food when I migrated because I was part of the migration south. I moved from East Harlem to Orlando, Florida with a Puerto Rican concentration uh, to, to Mississippi, to the Mississippi, Tennessee border. And right away, I started searching for food that was familiar to me. So it started with personal interest. Uh, I was used to Caribbean cuisine. My family is Puerto Rican and Haitian. So I was looking for a diversity of foods that I was used to in New York City. And then I teamed up with the Southern Foodways Alliance to do oral history interviews uh, about food uh, in the South, about the Latino population specifically in the South. So I took the kind of background experiences I had uh, in Orlando, where food was a space, a place for restaurants were a space for confrontation, contestation, but also cultural preservation. So there was that tension between the two. And that's what drew me to Summer Avenue. I found comfortable food, familiar foods there. But then I also learned about the conflicts that were taking place, an embrace of culture, uh, but there were flags being ripped down. So there was all kinds of, of interesting nuanced things happening in Summer Avenue. But I was drawn by the food, by the concentration of commercial businesses and the branding of Summer Avenue as an international district in Memphis. That drew me to it, it fascinated me. And I love the food. <laughs> so in what ways has, you know, I guess what, 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 are the, what are your takeaways from what that means? Cause I mean, we, you know, I think when, we, when people try to brand something as anything, it becomes this whole, a whole other story about, you know, will this in 10 years time, you know, lose its authenticity if it gets branded as some international enclave or, um, but even the fact that it is, is, is from a grassroots level because of these merchants who are um, kind of coexisting. And, and um, as you saw with, you know, that there, there's flags, you know, next to one another, it's sort of this small little, you know, Southern United Nations of, of, uh, of, of small business, but you know, what do you think the takeaway is when you see, you know, like the the murals on the side of buildings that are are hearkening back to, uh, you know, a place that certainly is not Memphis, but they're but it's it's um, it's grounding a business and a new life that is here in Tennessee and here is here in the South. What's the meaning of it all to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, I saw those some of those pictures you're showing are of Orlando, Florida, and some are of Memphis, and you wouldn't know which is which. Uh, again, because both are trying to depict a landscape. 
through the built of environment of something they've left behind or something they've tried to bring with them in terms of cultural preservation, uh, in terms of, again, cultural hybridization, which we started talking about before. Uh, you know, what you're seeing in terms of the interior of a restaurant that's uh, owned. I'm thinking of Vitiera, which is owned by a woman uh, from Colombia, another woman from Guatemala. They own the restaurant together and people go there and bring them actual artifacts when they travel to try and recreate that feeling of being Latin America. So it's about cultural preservation to me. It's about something so incredibly powerful. Uh, there was a linguistic landscape study done on Summer Avenue and it showed, I mean, loud and clear that people will not interact with others from other countries unless it has to do with food. If it has to do with going to a restaurant, uh, a market, there's just an openness. Somehow food is a space and place where people feel more comfort interacting. So I think at the ground level, that's something and that we need to hold on to and embrace as a way of, of interacting with other cultures. And I'm so excited that we focus so much on food and food ways because I really see that as, as a way that people are interacting in Memphis. But also there are problems with that because when you try and brand a space and place, uh, people think about you know what are the commercial interests involved in that and the investments and you know, are the people being taken advantage of? And I did interview folks, you know, some of the merchants and they weren't even aware of the branding, but they were excited about it, even if they weren't knowledgeable about it. Because again, they saw it as good for business and a way of interacting with others that would never go into their restaurant because they didn't know what food from Yemen was all about. But if it's an international district, suddenly people are willing to explore and taste food from Yemen. You know, again, not even limited to Latin American countries. There really was, you know, that kind of uh, multiculturalism on Supper Avenue that I saw. So, yeah, so, I think food is so powerful. And, you know, back, back to the kind of the, you know, the Walter Anderson side of it. When, when we when we look at his, his work and also his writings, he opens up all these connections that, you know, um, even if he wasn't explicitly thinking about, these things that he could not have seen, you know, beyond his time to, to even understand that they resonate. And I was thinking of one, this was his quote from Anderson, um, talking about his painting process where, you know, he was painting nature. So there was nature and, and the artist. And when he would interact, a third thing was born. And this, this third thing was a miracle. And it had me thinking as we were talking about and are talking about cultural diffusion and hybridization and just, the different places come in together that if, you know, if I were to, to get up and, and leave Mississippi um, or leave uh, the United States of America and go to another place, you know, I'm, I'm carrying something with me and I'm taking it to a new place. But what, what happens there when I get there and make a new life or make a new home is a third thing. And Anderson called this a realization, this kind of beautiful thing that would happen when, you know, the one plus one equals, you know, three for, you know, to, for lack of a better term, that there's something that happens that's more than the sum of its parts. And it's not, it's neither one thing or the other, it's birthed anew um, by having uh, two things coming together. And I, th I think that's something to think about as we think about American cities and certainly in the South as we're talking about it, because it's not, it's no longer the Memphis it was before. It's no longer or never was, you know, um, Columbia, but there's something happening where it's, uh, it's something brand new. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a whole nother concept that anthropologists are fascinated by. And I think of, I guess I go to the global South, where I think of the Caribbean, places like Puerto Rico, where again, you have, again, we're thinking of the global South, but you have this mixing of cultures from the influence of Spaniards uh, to the Taino Indians to the African slaves. And what you have now uh, are individuals who have migrated to Orlando, Florida from these spaces and places uh, in the Caribbean. But again, exactly what you're talking about, what you see in the Caribbean, you have all these cultures that have come together historically. And what you see now is this beautiful fusion. And those individuals are migrating to the South. So we're getting a taste of all of that. So there's transformation in cities and suburbs in rural spaces. 
Mm-hmm. So really, it's it's not even limited in terms of landscape. And you see that in terms of the transformation to place identity uh, in different communities. I think that's what people can relate to when they go down to a street that they they find has a transforming place identity. There's Latinization. You know, you see different signs with different uh, languages. There's a feeling of something new that's happening there. New migrants, new people, new energy. So it's an excitement for me. For others, totally. not always. So yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think you know, I was actually reminded when I was um, thinking about all this too of of. And I mentioned this to Zaire in, in the pre-show is just that cities and and we talked about this too are are living things. And I was actually thinking about an Upton Sinclair quote. You know, there's you know that great book, The Jungle, which is about the the Chicago of of old, the the meat markets and the factories. And you know, Upton Sinclair writes in, in this novel that you know it seemed a dream of wonder with its talc of human energy, of things being done, of employment for thousands of men, of opportunity and freedom of life and love and joy. And I think that to me, it, it's talking about this place identity um, or at least, you know, maybe even beyond our, um, our conception of, of uh, you know, our place in things that these cities, when we occupy them, start to have a life of their own, you know, break down place identity for me though, like just the terminology and, and maybe transition into what you think about you know, what the next chapter is in the South as it continues to evolve. Um, but like, what, what exactly, place identity, it seems obvious, but, um, you know, I don't know that people are, are talk, going around, walk, walking down the street, talking to each other about place identity all the time. Does it, w- what does it really mean? No, and people get upset when they lose it, when they lose a sense of place, when they feel their community has changed, it becomes very evident. Uh, but I studied place identity in the context of Latinization in Orlando, Florida. So you had a place that was 2% Hispanic and from 1980 to 2010 goes from 2% Hispanic to 52 point plus percent Hispanic. Complete change from the soundscape to the landscape to social, economic, political life, everything changes. Uh, It's no longer Albertson supermarket, you go to public Sabor supermarket. So when I talk about place identity, I talk about the feeling you have about the formation of an ethnic enclave. So that's been my interest, places that uh, some people would call an ethnic enclave, where you go and you feel like you're in New York City's Chinatown, uh, or for instance, uh, in Miami, in a Cuban concentrated community. So those are the places that have interested me, but I like to see the formation of them historically. So when did that first start to happen? You know, what happened to create the change and transformation? And with place identity, again, we think of place a lot of times as a geographic space on a map, uh, as a built environment, a physical form, but you know what has meaning and value to people? And that's where the contestation happens. Because with some of my research, I realized very quickly that for individuals, they felt it was their community. That space and place was something they built and invested in. And when all of a sudden they went to the supermarket down the street from their house and they heard the Spanish language and that's how they were greeted instead of in English, that caused really strong feelings and animosities. And again, that was all part of the place identity that was the initial when they moved there. And the fact that, you know what, places change and transform. The Southern cities are changing as are the suburbs and the rural spaces. So there's Latinization happening and all kinds of internationalization, different spaces. I'm thinking of Shelbyville, Tennessee, for instance, where you have a Somalian influx uh, that happened historically in the last couple of decades or so. So every place has a different story, a different history but I feel like the place gets changed and what it means gets transformed. And that's what I'm interested in, trying to document that transformation for people. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and when we go back and we think about, you know, again, art objects, taking it back to the very beginning, you know, these things that are kind of talismans of a time, but I think it's so fascinating with the the cultural anthropology work because it's not um, dependent on these objects. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of it is, unearthed by oral history and interview and and other kinds of mining of, of meaning that is is not as tangible and sometimes is unseen um you know as we talk about even the new orleans exception you were talking about just just like people are unseen sometimes the the uh 
the, the generation of these cities, the actual source of, of how we now navigate our world and the things that are, are out there. Sometimes it's hard to, to know where they came from unless, unless people are digging into it. So I guess the question for you, and, and then we'll, we'll bring Zaire back in a minute and, and uh, kind of get to the, uh, the little round table before we close. But what do you think is the future of, you know, of, of the Southern city? If um, you, know, you talk about enclaves and, and, and the ever changing, landscape of both our, our metro areas and also the suburbs and exurbs you know what what do you think is um interesting to you aside from your current work where do you think we're headed i'm hoping there'll be less fear of the foreign that's my hope and i see with the new immigrants coming in a huge entrepreneurial spirit at least in memphis where you see businesses you see outreach to the community and I really hope that will encourage people, you know, to, and I think food, again, I go back to food because that's a very easy way to start. And food leads to other conversations, deeper conversations. Food is a conversation into race relations and equity and all these other bigger questions that we can't directly hit head on all the time. But I feel like food is an entrance into them. So I hope in the Southern city with transformations, we see more opportunity to make these connections, to explore. And again, I think of some of the images you showed of Mitiera, for example, where those two women were very smart because they had Colombian food and that is their heart and soul. But you know what? They realized they needed to introduce Mexican food as well to be a viable business because that was familiar to folks in Memphis. So not only do you get Colombian food, you also get Mexican food. You get both because they realized there was a need to serve both because when they started with just one, people were not familiar with all the Latin American cuisines. But that's also a way of sneaking it in. You get introduced to both. At least you get to see it on the menu. So again, I think there's the opportunity for growth. That's what I see in Memphis. A lot of opportunity and in other cities, Southern cities, the same thing happening an opportunity to embrace instead of fearing the foreign. Anderson yeah. had that right with his travels. <laughs> and yeah, the, fe the fear, the fear is, is not going to get you anything. Uh, you know, you're not going to make any new discoveries if you've got that fear. And so I'm going to, we're going to bring Zaire um, back on. And, you know, she has, uh, she's been on Summer Avenue and I think probably tasted some of the food, but Zaire, what, what have you been thinking about while we've been talking? Any, any uh, questions arisen? Yeah, I agree with the, the food ways being a way in which, you know, you can come in to a culture. One, because I feel that like you feel like you can or you're allowed to because everyone eats. Everyone like you won't like I won't feel like an outsider coming to a restaurant because I, I like to eat. Right. Whereas if I, there was another cultural, you know, event that was happening throughout the city, maybe you won't feel as, you know, allowed to, you know, participate in such, you know, you know, way in cultural ways, you feel what I'm saying? And so I think being able to figure out how to approach that in a way, and, and I guess that is a question um, for you, Simone, like, how do you feel or would recommend how, for for folks to actually not feel like this uh not feel like an intruder or like cultural appropriation is really big now and we we want to be very you know um sensitive and respectful of culture of different cultures so how do you feel like we could really um begin to do that in addition to like cool ways you know, it's funny because there's a group, uh, Latino Memphis, that is trying to do that work. Uh, they have initiative Gateways for Growth, and they're trying to actually incorporate not just Latino immigrants, but refugees from Africa, other parts of the world into Memphis. And they're trying to use food as a way to bring people together uh, to talk about common struggles, challenges, but again, to look at identity in a way of where is the commonality, not the separateness. So they're, they're bringing people together over food. So again, let's have a potluck where we all bring food from our country together and we taste it. But where can we talk, not as Democrats or Republicans, but as mothers, for example, 
you know, as our commonality. Uh, or all people who are living, living in Hickory Hill and concerned about crime. So looking for what's in common, as opposed to what we tend to do, what is different in a group. So I'm seeing some groups and some initiatives from nonprofits. It's coming from nonprofits, I will say, to try and analyze in Memphis, you know, what do we need to do to bring together? Food is one way of, of just bringing people to the table to start yeah. the conversation. But again, I'm finding there are nonprofits that are trying to do the work. Again, trying to get people to open up and be vocal about what they need, their challenges, their struggles. And food is just to bring people to the table, let your guard down, but there's bigger issues. There are a lot of bigger issues. We just need to bring people to the table. So again, I think food can be sneaky too, <laughs> where it's a, it's an entry point, but there's a lot more to talk well, about. Well, you know, I think with food and, and art is, is similar. It can function, you can't, you can't eat the art, at least here at the museum, but um, you can, it can serve as a mediator of sorts, you know, both in terms of, you know, either coming to a place or standing in front of an artwork and looking at it together, there's that aspect to it, but also just having, you know, having another um, vehicle that contains culture to, to bounce off of. I mean, it, it really, when I think about the, you know, what you're talking about is commonality versus difference, you know, I, I think back to, you know, the, these seven motifs, you know, that Adolfo Besmo Gard was, was thinking about, like, what, what is the value of having these uniting symbols, you know, these seven symbols, you know, the, the spiral and the circle and the squiggly line. I mean, these are, they're simple things, but in fact, you know, could it be that we can, you know, create, um, you know, all of these forms that are in some ways recognizable um, across culture and, and give us a, an opportunity to think about, to kind of, to break down in some ways to its, you know, its composite parts, you know, while we're human and, we think about the city and all, all Anderson's uh, folks walking down the street. I mean, there is a commonality. I think there's, it's always important to understand what the, the cultural, what, what diffusion and hybridization is happening. You know, when someone is this appropriation and, you know, Walter Anderson would not have understood these terms and, and he, but he was just exploring and he was trying to put all of these um, influences through his filter and, and putting it back out to try to create something interesting, you know, but in the same way though, I just wonder, um, you know, I think the more that we can we can see that uh, this kind of creative expression, whether it's in a business, whether it's in you know food, whether it's in art or a mural on the wall, you know, there's just this inherent urge to either create something or to make a home, and and that goes um, you know across the the gamut, and and in that way, none of us are any different at all. Zaire, did you um did you get to taste some food on Summer Avenue? Oh yeah, um, I it's, I think it's called Taco Changas. It's the food truck, like it's a famous food truck here. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's very popular. And um, is it Berea Tacos? Is that how you pronounce it? But he, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but he. Um, it's like a taco, and it's it's kind of like melted together, and then you dip it in this like broth, and it is amazing it is delicious and every time every time you go down S summer avenue and you see this food truck there is a line all the time and there i mean it's diverse it's very very diverse everybody is coming to get these tacos and you know to get a taste of it mm -hmm. well, the secret is out <laughs> yeah i was gonna say shout out locally people in ocean springs you need to check out rosie's cantina just opened up a new location they've got those dipping tacos i don't know what the that's what they are on the menu i'm sure there's some better um kind of word for what what the what the chef would call it but yeah those are on point um i can't i can't get enough of those and the other thing i think desire you and me, but i want to talk just a bit before we um, you know, before we close, because I think it is such an interesting place is Mitiera, because I haven't been in there, but it was almost, you know, it is this atmosphere that the owners created. And I was struck by it and intrigued by it, obviously, for various um, self, you know, self-identifiable reasons. I mean, look at it. It's there's so much going on. It's very, uh, you know, kind of a playground to, for your eyes. I can imagine eating in there would be, you know, you wouldn't get bored waiting for your food because you'd have so much to look at, but also it's just like a landscape. And, you know, when we think about Anderson and, and nature and this intermixing between, 
you know, kind of an urban or at least a, a, a created environment versus a natural one. Um, I mean, what was it like being in there, Zaire? And I guess, Simone, you've been in there too. You took these pictures. What's your takeaway from that, that kind of landscape being artificially created um, for, you know, I would imagine it's kind of a way to, to bring a little bit of Columbia into the, into the space. It is. I think it shows the power of semi-fixed feature items. And I think they're so powerful. And again, it could be anything from a flag hanging in someone's car window that gives you that feeling of home or just signals the culture of elsewhere. So again, it's a relatively inexpensive way. Again, they've uh, from interviewing them, they've gotten items from customers. People just made a habit of bringing beautiful things in to hang on the walls, but they did that. It's two women who recreated uh, their, you know, vision of Latin America, their Latin America for customers. So again, it's it's using semi-fixed feature items in the built environment to create a landscape that you imagine, you know, being home. So yeah, I think like it's powerful for cultural preservation and giving others a unique experience. It's, it looks like the indoors became outdoors. It looks like they really are. Um, that, it's that's so I, intricate. The details are so, I mean, I, I love it. I love the experience of being there because they try to transport you to another space and place within Memphis. And as soon as you leave, you see nothing but what the concrete jungle. I mean, it's cement and there's a laundromat next door and you're back in Memphis. But when you step inside, you're in another world temporarily. And it's that escape that's so powerful for, for people who miss home, especially. So, and then for those who want to discover a new world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, um, I'm give you the last word. Yeah, I, I agree. When I, I stepped in, I was just like, okay, yeah, this is not the parking lot. <laughs> the parking lot is totally different from me, like actually walking into to the experience, but not only the the restaurant, but just in everything that we've talked about, and even me, you know, um, doing some filming on uh, Summer Avenue, I went into you know several establishments, you know, um, that that really cater to the Latino culture, and it's just the the importance of identity for like human, like human beings, like no matter where we go, we want to like identify, we want to like be identified with who we feel that we are and who we are, you know, and how that manifests itself. Like, of course, through our food, of course, through our decorations. And like you said, the fl our flags and things of that sort. And the young lady in the film or in the short, um, in Memphis, you know, I was talking to her. We we actually talked for a long time, and she was just, uh, just just talking about how she was so proud that people want to come in and and try and do, and and she she loves that because she uh, it allows her to again talk about her identity and like how you know she 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 loves it, and so I I just really think that I know I just went on a slight of a tangent but i think that um it, it all goes back to say like identity for us as human beings no matter what culture we're from is very very important and something that we should always you know um be proud of yeah that's true and i think that's a great way to, to kind of close it and we'll, we'll give susan um kind of weighing in here too to you know talk about all southerners and i think we could make the extension you know anyone from any region, but certainly in the South, we, we, we're proud of, of kind of finding each other and, and finding commonality. And I think, as we've said, food, as she's saying, is, is always one of those paths to peace. And I'll just bring in that, you know, we have an Orlando, formerly Memphis uh, viewer. So, you know, Simone, you've, uh, you've got some, someone moving in your, in your footsteps. <laughs> Um, but y'all, it's been great to, to have this conversation and to, to collaborate and to bring it back you know, to bring Anderson back to, to the contemporary space and to move uh, across time and hither and yon across the South and to think about some things that, um, you know, I think are totally appropriate given Walter Anderson's own cultural appetite and understanding that all things are connected. So, um, like I said, I appreciate you, uh, Simone, for working with us and Zaire, beautiful work as always. So y'all have a wonderful night. We're going to sign off and give it back to the people, but y'all be good. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.